Good morning, Calvary. I greet you in the name of Jesus. I hope, trust you're having a good time worshiping and studying the scriptures together. God is good. All the time, God is good. God is so good to us. He loved us when we were unlovely, and he wants to shed his love abroad in our hearts. The message today is a second of two taken from 1 Corinthians 13, the love chapter, as it's known many times. Uh, last Sunday was what love is, today what love does. I'm going to ask you to hang on to your seats. As I've done before, I have a lot to say and a lot of ground to cover. What love does. During the Korean War, a South Korean Christian civilian was arrested by the communists and ordered shot. But when the young communist leader learned that the prisoner was in charge of an orphanage caring for small children, he decided to spare him and kill his son instead. So they took his 19-year-old son and shot him right there in front of the Christian man. Later, the fortunes of war changed, and that same young communist leader was captured by the UN forces, tried and condemned to death. But before the sentence could be carried out, the Christian whose boy had been killed came and pleaded for the life of the killer. He declared that this communist was young and that he really did not know what he was doing. The Christian said, give him to me and I will train him. The UN forces granted the request and the father took the murderer of his boy into his own home and cared for him. And today that young man, formerly a communist, is a Christian pastor serving Christ. How is something like this even possible? It had to be that agape love in the heart of this Korean man to show that kind of love to the killer of his son. That same love, miraculous as it is, is available to us today. The love that can, can do things that you would not humanly be able to do. God is love, and God reached out in love to mankind. We received his love into our hearts, and now that love is to be extended to others. And I shared last Sunday what love is. Love is a commitment to do what is best for others. It is an amazing principle and heartwarming to think about. We could shake hands, and we did, and feel good about a message like that. But we can't let it there. Because love is primarily an action. It's not a, a glorified dis discourse of... of uh, you know, feeling, feeling good. It's, it's basically love needs to reach out in action. It's more than a feeling. It's a commitment to action. But what are the actions of love in a practical sense? What does love do? That is the crux of the message this morning. Let's stand to read our passage from 1 Corinthians 13. It's just a short passage, but I like to keep the tradition of standing and uh, we'll read to, I will read and you can follow along. What does love do? 1 Corinthians 13, verse 4 to 7. Love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. You may be seated. I'm keenly aware this morning of a, of a phenomena called list fatigue. I don't know how many of you have heard that, but it's called list fatigue. Fatigue. It's where the preacher or a teacher gets up front and has a whole long list of, that he wants to go over. Uh, lots of points to make, and you go down one after the other, and everybody gets tired of it. Stanley, how many points should you have in a message? Three. Well, I, I, I agree with that, that three is a good number, but I'm going to have ten points this morning to the message. 
And to keep you from getting all taken over with this list fatigue, I'm going to ask you to be on your toes to pick out one of those points, maybe two, maybe three, maybe all ten, that really speaks to you. Because this is straight from God's word. This is not, this is not a, a list that I have come up with. This is straight out of the passage that we just read from. Those four verses would have the capability of even more than ten points, but ten basic points of what love does. What does love do? And I want you to be looking for something personally that you can take from the message this morning. I know that the Holy Spirit wants to talk to you about one area, aspect of love that you really need to be responsive to and, and allow him to work in your lives. So let's hit, get going. Number one, love exhibits patience. Bearing with the faults of others in the process of helping them overcome them. Love exhibits patience. Uh, love is patient is what our text says. Love is patient. Patience is love under pressure. You get impatient and all of a sudden you start feeling, sting, you start bottling up. And what, how are you going to respond to that? Well, love helps you to respond properly to these kinds of events. It's an attitude toward events. It's an attitude toward people. People can be so difficult sometimes. I won't ask you to say amen. They can be unreasonable. They can be exasperating. And they take place basically too long. I don't know how many of you are bothered by it. When I'm driving down the road and this car ahead of me stops on the road and then turns. He already knew he was going to turn, or she. But they stop in the road, and then they turn. People can be exasperating. The easy response is to lash out. And maybe not physically, but, or even verbally, but in your mind, you're lashing out at this person with an attitude, with a word, with an action. Love exhibits patience. That's what this passage says from 1 Corinthians says, love exhibits patience. It's by committing to do what is best for others, by extending grace to them, by being concerned more about God's program than my own, confidence that God is working even while I am waiting. God is working, giving him time to work. By seeking the welfare of others above our own, their well-being, their happiness, their spiritual progress, and their schedule. Love is the commitment to do what is best for others, even if it messes with my schedule. Love is the commitment to do what is best for others, even if I must reschedule what I want done. Even if I consider others' schedule more important than my own. Bearing with others, with the faults of others, in the process of helping them overcome them. My question to you is, will you allow the Holy Spirit to work this beautiful aspect of love in your life? Love exhibits patience. Some of you need that. Some of you need the love of God to work patience in your lives. Number two, love shows kindness. Love shows kindness. Relating to others with a sensitivity toward them as persons. I read a cute little story. It's by a Jim Shipstead. While Penny and I were walking in the park the other day, a 10-year-old boy came racing around a tree, almost running into us, and said, Dad, where's Amy? Instantly, he realized his mistake and said, Sir, I'm sorry. I thought you were my dad. I made a mistake. I replied, That's okay. Everybody makes mistakes. As he began to walk away, I noticed he had a limp as well as the features of a child with Down syndrome. After having walked about 10 yards as an afterthought, he turned around and started retracing his steps toward us. My name is Billy, he said. You both were very nice to me. Can I give you a hug? After giving each of us a tight hug, he said, just wanted you to know that you're my friends and I'm going to be praying for you. I have to go now and find my sister Amy. Goodbye and God bless you. Tears came to both Penny and my eyes as we watched Billy, that child with Down syndrome, 
limped to the playground to play with his little sister. After Billy went down the slide, his mother came over to him and gave him a big hug. It was obvious that he was a special child to her. Sometimes God uses the billies of the world to break down our walls of sophistication to show us what genuine kindness is all about. We must never underestimate the impact that a hug, smile, or an encouraging word may have on a person's life. Love shows kindness. We talk about kindness a lot of times with little children. You know, you got to be kind. This is something for the preschool class. But is it really? The world would be a much better place if there were more kind people. The world would much be a much better place. Proverbs 19 says, What is desirable in a man is his kindness, and it's better to be a poor man than a liar. 1 John 3.17 says, But if anyone has the world's good and sees his brother in need, yet closes his heart against him, how does God's love abide in him? Little children, let us not love in word or talk, but in deed and in truth. Kindness is an action that love does. Love shows kindness. Number three. Love does not envy. Love does not envy. Not desiring, resenting, or working against that another possesses or enjoys. The natural worldly person constantly struggles with envy. I don't know if you've thought about that, but that is a big struggle of the carnal word envy. I want... I, I, Somebody's doing it better than I am. And you can't walk into any room anywhere where someone is not better than you or doesn't have more things than you or has, has, has other advantages that you don't have. And you can, you, can, uh, you can envy that person or you can rejoice for them. That's what love does. Love is, 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 is the, the action that rejoices when others do well. Thomas Lindbergh in his leadership magazine shares the following. Two shopkeepers were bitter rivals. Their stores were directly across the street from each other, and they would spend each day keeping track of each other's business. If one got a customer, he would smile in triumph at his rival. One night, an angel appeared to one of the shopkeepers in a dream and said, I will give you anything you ask, but whatever you receive, your competitor will receive twice as much. Would you be rich? You can be very rich, but he will be twice as wealthy. Do you wish to live a long and healthy life? You can, but his life will be longer and healthier. What is your desire? The man frowned, thought for a moment, and then said, Here is my request. Strike me blind in one eye. When we love... We rejoice at the success of others. We don't envy. Their happiness is on top of our list. I was thinking and meditating over this this past week as I was working on this message, and, and the, the man John the Baptist came to my mind. John the Baptist was, was a great man of God, and he... He, he, was, he was just the greatest man in the old covenant, basically, that ever was. But then he came on the scene, and he was, he was, he was, he was usurped by Christ, if you will. He, Christ, everybody started flocking to Christ. And people came up to John and said, John, look, this man is, is now teaching, and everybody's flocking to him. And John said, that, that's fine. That's good. I'm good with that. I am good with that. That is a characteristic of love, is being blessed by the successes of others. We believe that he allowed the successes around us. This is agape love. Are you struggling with envy and jealousy in your life? Check your motives. Is God's love working in your heart? Ask God for more of his love. 
Love will cause that envy and jealousy to be replaced with contentment and joy. Contentment in what God is doing in your life, joy in what God is accomplishing in the life of others. Isn't God's work beautiful? Will you, will I, allow God's Spirit to work this beautiful fruit of love in our hearts? Number four, love puts others first. Love puts others first. Treating others as having more value or importance than myself. Love puts others first. Love is patient and kind, our text says. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or puffed up. And the, re and the love causes us to uh, disappear. I don't know if you know someone like that. Humility is not making fun of myself or denigrating myself. Humility is disappearing. Humility is allowing others to be there and all of a sudden I am not visible. I have disappeared. That is what humility is. It's not thinking less of myself but not thinking of myself at all. Thinking of others and putting others first. I, in my college years, I was, I stayed, I boarded with a couple over in Minerva High. I was going to school in Pittsburgh. And I boarded with this, this family in, in, in Minerva, Ohio. Some of you would know it, who, I, who it was, but I'm not going to say their names. But th they, they were that way. You came to their house. And I, I stayed, I went out to their house a lot because I knew them. And I spent time, a lot of time with them on weekends. And uh, they made you feel like a king or a queen when you were at their house. I remember one time, specifically, as I was leaving their house, they're out there taking their handkerchiefs and wiping their eyes. And, you know, they're so sad because I left. Love puts others first. That's what love does. And it causes you to disappear. Love one another, Romans 12 says, with brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Philippians 2, do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only, his, only on his own interests, but also the interests of others. And of course, Jesus was the perfect example of this when he washed the feet of his disciples. Can we love as Jesus loved? Robert E. Spear says that several years ago he was being entertained by the president of a small college in the South. The school had limited guest facilities, so the head of the institution offered him his apartment. I woke up early the next morning, said Spear, when I heard someone tiptoe tip into the room. I lay there quietly with my eyes open, just a bit, a slit to see who it was. To my surprise, the president of the college walked in, picked up my dirty boots, and walked out. I got out of bed, opened the door a crack, and watched him take them to an adjoining hallway. Then he got down on the floor and began polishing them. I could have cried at the sight. His hospitality and thoughtfulness showed me what a great man he really was. Some years after that, he rose to national prominence. Because of his complete humility of spirit, God elevated him to a higher position. Number five, love does not behave rudely. Yeah, it's there in 1 Corinthians 13. Being sensitive to the effects that my behavior may have on others. 1 Corinthians 13, verse 4 to 5 says, Love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. Love is not rude. So guys, if you belch after eating a meal, Right in front of your family, you need the love of God in your heart. I'm serious. 
Love isn't rude. There was one couple that, uh, um, whose wife asked for an annulment of their marriage because her husband was so rude. And it was granted. Love is not rude. Love is not rude. Being sensitive to the effects that my behavior may have on others. We live in a rude world. People are just down stinking rude out there. Common courtesy seems to be in short supply. People cut each other off in traffic. Women are no longer treated courteously. Old people are no longer treated with respect. Now, this kind of behavior is not just now. It's been going on for years since the beginning of time, actually. How much harm has been done by those who are crass and insensitive to others? Fellow believers, let the love of God come into your heart and be sensitive to what other people, and, and cut out the rudeness. Just be courteous to people. Be nice to people. And the root cause of, of, of rudeness is selfishness. I don't care what others think. I'm just concerned about myself. How many of you are tempted when a telemarketer calls you to slam down the phone or say some nasty things and then slam down the phone. They have no right to be a calling me. I didn't want their call. Do you know that might actually be an opportunity to say something to someone? I, re I read the story about this woman from up in Toronto who had a ministry of doing that. And she would end up praying with people on the phone because she asked them, look, she would listen to their spiel and then she asked them, but do you know the Lord? <laughs> I, I want to do that. I want to do that. I actually tried it a couple times last week when I was thinking about this message. Hello, this is Sam. Jesus loves you. Hey, it's an opportunity to touch someone's life. They are real people. Many of them are being paid minimum wage. Yeah, they are. And that's their job. Love is the opposite of selfishness. Let's recognize rudeness for what it is and practice godly love in our daily walk. I, I suspect this is one thing that some of you can need to work on it. Especially you guys. Number six. L love maintains a long fuse. I had it titled differently at that point. I just, I changed it when I was working on it. Love maintains a long fuse. You all know what a fuse is, right? Most of you do. There's, there's, a, there's a, maybe a fireworks or something like that, and there is a pit of combustible material that you, you light the end, and, and the fire goes along the fuse until it gets to the charge, and then boom, it goes off. Love maintains a long fuse. When's the last time you got provoked? I don't, have, don't raise your hand, okay? Maybe it's somebody sitting right beside you that provoked you. How did you respond to provocation? Responding to provocation under the Spirit's direction rather than according to my feelings. Love maintains a long fuse. Where there is uncontrolled anger in my life, there is the absence of agape love. If I'm easily irritated at others, if it takes only a little misconduct on the part of others to make me angry, I need more of the love of God in my heart. The great 18th century preacher and theologian Jonathan Edwards had a daughter with an uncontrolled temper. 
When a young man asked Dr. Edwards for his daughter's hand in marriage, he said no. The young man was crushed. But I love her and she loves me, he pleaded. That makes no difference, Edward replied. She isn't worthy of you. But she is a Christian, isn't she? The young man argued. Yes, said Edwards, but the grace of God can live with people with whom no one else could ever live. How does love keep us from being easily provoked? Love allows us to keep from thinking about ourselves so much. Love allows us to focus on others' good more than our own. Love allows us to see others' needs and to give them priority. Love for others helps us to make allowance for others' shortcomings. Is there ever room for anger in our lives? Is there such a thing as righteous indignation? I'm not expecting an answer from you. It's a rhetorical question. Is there such a thing as righteous indignation? Yes, there is. But it's a very, very small set of circumstances where righteous indignation is allowed. If God's name is used in vain, I think that you can be angry about it. You're allowed to be angry. Maybe if you see a little child getting abused, maybe there's righteous indignation that can happen. There would be other circumstances. Jesus was so angry at his house being made a house of thieves rather than a house of prayer that he got a whip and, and got them all out of there. But the, the, the instances where anger is actually righteous indignation is very small. And it's never when you are personally being attacked. If it's in a personal attack on you, your response in anger is not righteous indignation. Jesus never did that. If he was being attacked, it never, he never responded in anger. And, and you should never either. You should have a long fuse. You should use a long fuse. Number seven, keeps no record of wrongs. How are we doing on the list? Are you still with me? We're down to number seven, so I think, I think we're going to make it. Love keeps no record of wrongs. Um... In our text, it says, uses the word resentful. It's actually the Greek word logizome, to take an inventory. And that's where we get the, the term keeping a record of wrong. Love does not keep an inventory. Doesn't keep an inventory. This is one that I need. The natural incantation inclination is for us to keep an inventory of things that people did to us. And we maybe not don't even think about it until somebody else does something else. And all of a sudden we go back to that list. And we keep adding to it. We keep adding to that list. I had a man in our congregation where I was pastor before who was an angry old man. And he would, he would say, well, I, I forgave. But every time you go to talk to him about, he had this list of things that people did against him. And that anger just built up in his life. And that bitterness just built up in his life. And love doesn't keep a list of wrongs. That's what it says here. Love doesn't keep an anger. You got to forgive, right? If you don't forgive and you keep that list going, you're not following the command of Scripture. Scripture says to forgive as Christ forgave you. How did Christ forgive you of your sins? He forgave you and he took and blotted out, he says in the Old Testament, I blot out their transgression as far as the east is from the west. And that's what we're supposed to be doing. 
we are to forgive and not keep a list. We dare not keep a list. We all hurt each other. There is, we are not human. If I don't hurt you somewhere along the line, I'm sure I've hurt some of you. And if you keep that list somewhere in the back and you haven't forgiven it, it's going to mess with you. It's going to mess with you. Does not dwell on others' faults, imagining evil motives in the words and actions of others. Love does not keep a record of wrongs. Number eight, rejoices with the truth. Finding delight in seeing people learning and living by God's principles. Take that from verse six. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Many believers will not participate. Believers in general will not participate in gross sin, but they sure enjoy watching others. That's wrong. Getting joy of what, out of watching wrongdoing is, is, is an indication of a problem in your life. The ones with agape love, God's love in their hearts, are hurt when injustice and wickedness prevails. It grieves them when sins prevail. They see the terrible nature of sin and its effect on God and man. The psalmist, for example, in Psalm 119 says, My eyes shed streams of tears because people do not keep your law. The King James uses the word, rivers of waters run down my eyes. Paul, writing to the Philippians, says, For many of whom I have told you and now tell you even with tears, walk as enemies of the cross of Christ. Does sin trouble you? Does sin trouble you? Does it hurt inside? You know, we can become so callous to sin it to the point when it seems commonplace and we no longer grieve at it. Sin needs to make us upset. This is the heart of God. We rejoice with the truth. That brings us happiness. We grieve when sin is there. Number nine. Love puts a lid on it. It's kind of a homely term, but love puts a lid on it. Willing to cover those things that God has covered. I take that from verse 7 of our text. Love bears all things. The Greek word is stego. means to put a roof over. Love puts a roof over all things. And figuratively, it means to cover with silence. Love covers with silence the offenses of others. 1 Peter 4, 8, above all, keep loving one another earnestly, since love covers a multitude of sins. Out of love, we seek to protect the sinner. Does he deserve to be exposed? Do we all, don't we all deserve to be exposed when we sin? Yes, we do. We all sin. Does love seek to let the whole world know about that sin? No, it doesn't. Love puts a lid on it. Should not sin be exposed, you might ask? The Bible teaches that sin needs to be confessed and forsaken. And I do, need that, I do believe that we need to expose sin, but we don't need to broadcast it all over the world. And we don't need to go to church on a prayer meeting and ask for a prayer concern about somebody. I won't ask for a show of hands, but you have given a prayer request about somebody's failing, and you shouldn't have done it. Maybe in a very general sense you could, but so many times gossip is clothed in this thing of giving prayer requests for someone who has a problem. Love seeks the benefit and the well-being of the per other person. And I don't take joy in exposing sin because somehow it makes me look good. We look at the welfare of the sinner. 
Sometimes they need to be exposed if it's public sin. And there are cases for that. But we do it very, very, very careful to do that. Look at what our motive is for exposing sin. Love covers all things is what the scripture says. Do I have God's love in my heart? We've made it to number 10. Love endures, maintaining unfailing confidence in right, continuing in faithfulness so no matter what adversity comes. Love endures. We are tempted to give up on people. We are tempted to give up on people. You know who almost never gives up on somebody? It's, it's a parent whose child is a prodigal. You look at a parent who has a prodigal child, and I know what I'm talking about. You don't give up. You look at the story of, of the prodigal child in Luke 15 where he talks about the son who went and lived his life out in, in, with, with, with sinners and ended up feeding the pigs. And you read that story down to the end and all of a sudden you, the, the, the father in that story looks up and sees his son coming back. Well, was he, did he just happen to be out there looking for his son? No, I think he was waiting. And he had, he still believed. He still believed that his son was coming back. Love endures, maintaining unfailing confidence in right, continuing in faithfulness no matter what adversity comes. Love is not always practical. It doesn't make sense, but it continues to believe, it continues to hope, and it continues to endure. I'm glad that God's love reached out to me when it didn't make sense. It was the love of God. And my, can that same love uh, be in my heart and reaching out to others? Can I reach out to others? The young person who continues to stumble, that person in my life that is such a trial, can I continue to believe in people when all the evidence points otherwise? Does God's love keep the hope alive? God's love didn't give up on me, dare I give up on others. Okay, how to wrap this up. It's, it's a whole list of different things that this... Uh, passage of scripture talks about that love does. I hope that you picked out one that could speak to you especially. Um, and if you need a review of what it is, just go back to 1 Corinthians 13, okay? Just go back to this passage. Go back to it and, and, and look over down that list and see what love does and see what the Holy Spirit is speaking to you. We all need the love of God in our hearts, love that is patient and kind, love that's not rude or easily provoked, love that is not self-seeking or jealous, love that keeps no record of wrong, love that keeps on believing and hoping. I pray that God's love would be in your life and in mine, love that takes action. The church needs that love. The world needs that love. Beloved, John says in 1 John 4, let us love one another for love is from God and whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. We'll call for a song.